Hello, everybody. Thank you, Gustavo, for the introductions. If I can, I mean, you not, cannot hear my voice, I will raise it. Today is not a good day for my voice. I'm sorry. Um, yes, thank you. So um, I will start to talking a little bit about my research group, a little bit about my background, because the background that I brought has a related link with the presentation that I have today. Uh, I will present the risk assessment project, and I will briefly summarize what are the other projects which I am looking for collaboration. So my laboratory is the Food and Health Engineering Lab. It's a pretty young laboratory. I joined MSU in uh, 2017, and I can say that we are an interdisciplinary group of chemical and biophysics engineers. And we would love to understand the mechanisms of oxidative stress and the role in the overall life process. So we apply metabolomics, lipidomics, and high tropo uh, chromatography techniques to um, quantify biological signatures or metabolites. And we also apply high uh, statistical analysis for that purposes, and in this case, dietary exposure, and obviously the major target, the major concern that we have are the chronic diseases. So as I mentioned it before, I am a chemical engineering, PhD in food science. So I was training to reduce the microbial load in the food manufacturing or food processing. So I have several publications, 80% of my publications from my CV comes from food science, food processing. And as you can imagine, then I was training to reduce all the microbial pathogenous load in uh, thermal and no thermal processing. So I have several publications, but after um, join a group in Washington State University when they were uh, working in no thermal technologies like high pressure, uh, ultra um, high uh, pulse electric fields, um, I was starting to question in myself, okay, we reach our goal, that is the microbial reduction law. Great. We have a shell life of this given product, and my work is done. What happened next? So I started to question, okay, I achieved the microbial load reduction, but what will happen when I reach by thermal or either non thermal temperatures this reduction? Maybe other components can start to be degradating, can start to be um, with any denaturalization. So that's why we um, start to think about what we publish this. Uh, review when we were questioning the community in the food science area to what is happening if there are lipid oxidation after this food processes manufacturing. With that idea, when I joined MSU, I thought my goal is the chronic diseases because my um, question has been always uh, be okay. I finished my product; it's in the shelf line. What will happen after we eat this product that I produce? So with a holistic point of view approach, I build a processomic. Since then, I am an engineer, but I'm interested in the application of the omics techniques. We um, create this um, program. When I am interested in food, obviously, because I am food scientist, okay? And we are what we eat. So what happened with the processing is critical because it's part of the food quality and food safety. I would like to apply the OMIS technique for identification and quantification of any biological signature or food signature, and that can potentially be used as a biomarker in a future studies that can relate with chronic diseases. And that's why I am applying my engineering knowledge to this overall holistic approach. So br very briefly, again, we are applying hydropo uh, chromatography techniques. We are also applying um, ordinary differential equations because we are taking the any given system as a, uh, with boundaries pretty well defined in the space and in the time. And some examples of that could be a model system that we can build, mimic um, a lipoprotein, for example, an anodisc, a macrophage, or we can also use biospecimens um, food, cells, in vivo system with the goal to um, develop or detect biomarkers. So now I will start to thinking 
about a key molecule in our life. It's cholesterol. As you know, cholesterol is a key molecule because it's an important part of the cell membrane. Okay? Uh, we have up to 50% in different um, um, lipids constituents is cholesterol. It participates in bile's eyes degradation, is critical for the placenta and the baby growth development, and is critical in the brain function, is a precursor of hormones and vitamins, etc. So, cholesterol is a pretty important in um, the mammal systems. Usually, cholesterol is a molecule that has a double bond and an allylic change. When cholesterol gets oxidized, generate up to 100 compounds that are pretty similar to the parent compound, but have different group forming the cholesterol oxidation products. These compounds exert different properties than the parent cholesterol in our body, okay? So these compounds can be generated in our body by ROS, in the food by thermal and not thermal processing, in the food also by uh, long-term storage, shelf line, packaging, handling of the food. And as any lipid oxidation mechanism has three phases, initiation, propagation, and determination with the final production of these COPs. Why I'm focusing on these ones? Because evidence over more than 40 years has been shown us that they can be um, um, part of the mechanism that induce carcinogenesis. They can damage the DNA. Um, they can remodelate or be the, um, part of the genesis of the atherosclerosis. Um, has been proven that they have cytotoxic, pro-oxidant and pro-inflammatory properties. Um, they can modify the stiffness of the cell membrane because as you can see here, this is the cholesterol in the cell membrane, but the other compounds that are pretty similar, the structure is different and can open or close and modify the uh, cell membrane changing its properties. Now, what are the dietary sources of fat and cholesterol? The food or daily food. Our group has been dedicated the time to um, discriminate the oxysterols or COPs that are endogenous generated through the P450 family, the um, enzymatic format after a ROS, or the dietary format through, obviously, the intake of food. So we have the capability to discriminate between these three different mechanisms of production. And our paper generated from our group was um, highlighted by the Institute of Life Science because of the significance showing the toxicity of these compounds through the diet. So a lot of cholesterol actually are endogenously synthesized. For the COP is, uh, you know, how much actually from diet and how much from uh... We, uh, uh, our body um, promote, uh, generate more than the 70% of our uh, the, the needs in cholesterol. And has been shown that the diet can reach up to 30% of the load in our body. How, how about the COPs? The COPs are still is not known. That's why it's the research of, uh, that I will show you because some literature has been testing in marine models with a specific high fat diet, but I will show you that the high fat diet has a bias in comparison with the real diet that we are here or we have here in USA. Okay? Any other question? Again, why these compounds has been um, a health risk factor? Well, because they has been um, um, related with cardiovascular diseases, a specific expression and I am highlighting those ones that comes from the diet has been related with neurological diseases like Parkinson, um, sclerosis multiple, Alzheimer. And again, some literature has proposed the mechanism and the effect of these compounds 
in marine models. Few or nothing has been showing still yet in human interventions. Our laboratory during this couple of years here in MSU has been profiling for different biospecimen the content of these compounds in human placenta, in breast milk, for example, amniotic fluid, obviously, moving models as well, and we have the capability to profile the total content, and when I'm telling the total, I mean that the whole amount generated plus identify the profile of these compounds. Can you, question, can you measure this in the blood or is it only tissue? No, blood and any biofluid also. Okay. Uh, we have been using amniotic fluid, um, um, obviously plasma, blood, um, brain, but I didn't include it in this slide, but we have also brain, and we are waiting for cerebrospinal fluid also to, to build this profile. Stable are these values in these tissue or, or samples? Stable, you mean? Mm, Repeatable, reproducible? Yes, yes. I mean, we have the capability to, um, again, quantify totally because we have developed the method for over more than 10 years and we have the validated method. Um, we have obviously three repetitions, individual repetition of each quantification, and we use the isotopic labelet method when we compare with the deuterate actual compound for this quantification. So. Okay, cholesterol has been studied for more than 80 years. Maybe their oxidation, oxidation derivatives could be a new toxicological topic. Oxysteros or COPs has been also um, related with the deposition of different tissues and also has been relating with other um, chronic diseases that at the beginning I thought maybe they are not related with the diet but has been shown some, some relationship. And again, we are what we eat. So the food is all the time in my mind connecting with the deposition of these compounds. So the FDA total dietary study, maybe you are aware of this, uh, starting in 2014 and closes in 2017. And it's an FDA study when they have been monitoring more than 800 contaminants, mostly pesticides, industrial chemicals, radionuclides, um, in the average US diet. So with this idea, they inspiring me and question myself, okay, these contaminants, pesticides mostly, has been added when we are harvest, harvesting the food, in the farms, so, et cetera. But these compounds has been formed during the processing and the homemade cooking, and there are no listing, or maybe we are not thinking about to list them. So in base of this idea, and having into account the new classification, um, NOVA, I don't know if you are familiar, they are started by a Canadian group uh, in 2016. They reclassificate the groups of meals, foods that we already know. The first group, they name it unprocessed or minimally processed foods. So are um, fresh milk, eggs, and those meal, uh, any kind of product that is in raw mostly. Then we have the group two that are the processio culinary ingredients, so it's the minimally processed food. The group three is the processed food that includes can, beverage, fruits, legumes, maybe chop it in a salad, side ups, cheese, uh, unpackaged freshly, bread, um, uh, some salted meats, beer, wine. And finally, the group four, that is the ultra processed, that is all meals that has been pre-processed or has been highly processed before to be consumed. So again, how we relate this NOVA with the total dietary study? Well, due to the increase of the food supplies and that dietary patterns of high income country, there is a need or increase of ready to eat meals, ready to drink beverage that 
should be heated pretty fast and are convenient products. So thinking on that, the food processing has been remaining all the time by side, has been never considered as a part of this potential issue. So the NOVA classification is not an acronym, it's a name per se, and again, is defined as the food classification that categorizes foods according to the extent and purpose of the food processing rather than the items or nutrients or calories. So in base of this new classification, we focus in the ultra-processed foods, and the major reason is because the Wednesday diet is mostly composing by the ultra-processed foods. NOVA classification is already recognized by the Food and Agricultural Organization, and again, uh, we are mostly used using this classification for this research in particular. Again, ultra-processed food is fast food. We know that fast food has become a major part of the American diet. Um, between 2013 and 2016, about 37% of the USA adults consume fast food in a given day. Um, one given day in the USA, an estimate of 36.6 or approximately, approximately 84 million of adults consume fast food. So in a survey, we can see that this percentage is important, it's about 35. Among this percentage, we know that they has been um, consuming the, during the lunch about 43%, during the dinner 22%, so the lunch is the most um, common meal to con be consumed with the fast food, and usually men, almost 50% of the men that has been consuming fast food um, uh, in comparison with the, with the women. So with this idea and this information, we also went to look what is the fat consumption in USA. So we know that the average is 50 grams per day and that the 66% consume fat at home, 34% consume fat uh, at a restaurant, cafeteria, etc. From that fat content, we narrow to cholesterol Cholesterol average consumption is between 150 and 450 milligrams per day. Around 67% consume at home, 33% consume restaurant, cafeteria, fast food, etc. So with this information, we have built this uh, research study that is the um, risk assessment of cholesterol oxidation products as a biomarkers of U.S. consumption uh, of ultra-processed food. We have three major aims. The first aim is to build a database because again, we don't know what is the real amount in this ultra-processed food. We don't really know. So that is the first aim. The aim two is related with um, an admetoxic study, and I will explain later what is the reason of this. And the aim three, obviously, is the dietary um, assessment exposure of these compounds in the diet. For the purpose of analysis, we have split the um, items, food items, in three different categories. The first one is the high priority. That means that these items in the list, at least one of these is present in all USA um, homes. The fast food, obviously, and the ready to eat that I explained already. Sorry. Okay, so examples of ultra processed meals canned food, uh, um, for example, pre cooked pizzas that can be just warmed and, or, or microwaved or warmed in order to have um, the meal ready to eat, or they need to be just quickly oven baked or they need to be just um, boil a pan, or they need to have only the addition of hot water, brief mixing, and then you can eat it. So we have over 400 items in this list. Obviously, I'm showing you just a summary 
of these, clam choya, um, ice cream, lasagna with meat, popcorn, salad dressing, mac and cheese, chicken noodle, etc. The fat content in ready to eat, again, we have been tracking the brand, the weight of the portion, the price of the portion, etc. And we have been profiling the total fat content and we have been comparing with the nutritional information that is already in the lab. As we can see, most of the uh, fat content match with the label information. Others don't. They are higher in comparison with the fat content that has been already reported. So again, there is a lot of information that we are getting from this analysis. Also, we have been profiling not only the total fat content, but also the fatty acid profiles, because it's giving us important information, such as if it's a um, short or saturated fat acid, if it's a monounsaturated fatty acid, if it's a polyunsaturated fatty acid. And this is only an example of two items that we are reporting in milligrams per fat of the sample, milligrams per 100 grams of samples, or we can report as a milligrams per grams of serving, serving of that given item. Any question? This is the database. Again, fat, this is the COP's profile, as you can see, roast beef, ham, and provolone from Jimmy John's versus chicken with vegetables from Panda Express, and this is how usually uh, chromatograph profile <coughs> looks like with all these species that we are identifying. Sorry, what's, what's on the x-axis there? What is that scale? Um, 5 to 27, what is, what is that? Uh, this is the retention time. Okay, so uh, what, what does this do? This just tells you that there's those peaks of all the... The species, COPs individual the species, sample. yes, in given sample. Okay, then we ask Just a, a just general example as yeah. we are profiling them. Then these are the summarized results. Again, this is just a short table. We have more than 400 items. As you can see, for example, we have uh, the cholesterol content in a Panda Express fry shrimp, pretty high. Cholesterol, okay? And the COPs, again, these are derived from cholesterol from the Panda Express, is low, as I expected. But for example, mac and cheese, that has a cholesterol content relatively low, has a major content of COPs. What has made me to think these results? Processing, like the over-processing? The processing itself. You can see this has high amount of cholesterol, but the content of COPs is relatively low. This has less cholesterol, but the total amount is relatively high in comparison, again, with other meals. So, so you don't have variance within the cholesterol? It's just a oh, yes, yes, we have it. Yes, yes, of course, we didn't put. No, variance. I mean, the cholesterol, this, I'm sorry about my ignorance. <laughs> it's a single molecule, or you have variance? different types. No, 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 it's a single molecule. Okay. It's the so total it's just, cholesterol. So if it is, okay, so that's, that's total cholesterol. Total cholesterol. But the total cholesterol has different compositions? Mm, no. No. Okay. It's okay. total. So, okay. Yeah. <laughs> the total. Oh, no, no, no. The total is the, the, the overall um, esterified and esterified cholesterol. The total one. Well, but the dietary cholesterol. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, it's, uh, it's just a single molecule. Yes. Okay. There yeah, is no um, another molecule similar. Okay. It's just okay. cholesterol. And again, since uh, this is a um, deuterate isotopic uh, method, we don't have error because the molecule deuterated is similar to this one, you know, just with C or 7 uh, <laughs> protons in extra. So, so, so this is based on how many samples? Uh, since uh, this is fast food, we have been purchasing my student from different, um, for example, brands located here in Michigan. So this 
should be expanding obviously outside. However, again, since most of this brand has already standardized the recipes, so it's a, something that we might need to consider. But so we have three independent purchase of meals. So this is your preliminary data on your yes. application? Yes. So, but I'm thinking about, you know, if, if it's very a lot by our, you know, the brand names and also by, by the type, you know, a, a lot of the dietary service probably will be useless because, you know, we never differentiate the, um, where you, where you buy the uh, food or, you know. Yes, but as you can see, these are mostly franchises. Again, when they, in theory, has standardized already their portions and, you know. So um, obviously they, they will have our ability. We purchase, I think, from McDonald's here and from McDonald's in New York and from McDonald's in San Francisco. But from now is what we have available here in the area. And like each eating is like an average of like... Yes, I'm sorry. The, I didn't notice that we don't have the standard deviation here. I'm sorry, yes. We have three independent purchases or meals that has been processed independently. Okay, and this is the average of those um, meals. <coughs> okay. Okay, that is just a summarize of the ultra processes and ready to eat products. However, again, since 66% uh, of the fat and cholesterol consumed in the USA comes from home, we start to thinking, hey, we need to pay attention how are we cooking. Okay, so this, the other aim in 1B is to mimic the homemade cooking here in USA. So we have raw materials that are mostly meats, products. We have different cooking methods, so the most common cooking methods as pan fry, grill, roast oven, microwaving. And we have um, recipes with spe uh, spices and without spices, and I will tell you why. So again, we are mimic the we purchase in local stores. Also, we purchase in the meat laboratory and um, in farms. So we have at least three independent sources of the meats: poultry, lamb, chicken, etc. We follow a given recipe that is the most consumed recipe suggested by what we eat in America. And some of the recipes have salt, white pepper, or another spice, some others don't. We cook it as traditionally we cook at home, but we are following the temperature that the product is rich in, etc. If the recipe is, for example, one tablespoon of vegetable oil, we add that as it. So, and we are extracting, obviously, the fat. So to give you an idea what we have been considered, these are some of examples of the meats that we have been tested, the cooking methods that we have been tested. Again, these are the most um, used in USA diet. For example, the steamed cooking method is not one of the common used here in USA, uh, so that's why we remove it. So again, it's grill, the fry, microwave, boil. Only we found it for the frankfurter. It's the only one, oven roasted in pan fry. And this is our matrix that um, we are following to uh, mimic the home cooked meats. Uh, did you buy products that were like labeled as like organic meat as non-organic? No, no, we didn't. Just like. Normal, yes, no, we didn't thought about it. No, there is no that discrimination until now, but it's something that maybe we might need to consider an extent or, you know, or database. So, for example, we found that um, um, cooking with different temperatures with these methods, an example, ham cured has been oxidized almost 61%. So this is the cholesterol content that has been originally in the raw material and after cooking has been reduced. What does it mean? That this cholesterol has been formed, these COPs. So the oxidation is around 61%.
Other example is the pork roast. Again, this is the original amount of cholesterol. And after cooking method, this is the remaining cholesterol. That, that means that is forming new species of cholesterol oxidation products. So what about the leakage of the cholesterol in the pan? Uh, we are recovering that so, too. So you are doing both? So when you say, when, if you go back to the previous one, when you say we started with 61.73%, well, see, we, we that is the oxidation. No, this is the oxidation calculated in base of the original cholesterol and the remaining cholesterol. But what about the cholesterol go out, out of the... We have been collecting these uh, leak CVTs and we right. need to um, quantify to make this balance. Okay. How has been this breakdown? Mm -hmm. And in base of that, good question, because here I have another information mm -hmm. that is the fat. Okay the oxidative status, the cooking loss is the question that you are asking because yes, when we are cooking, there is a reduction of the meat and there is a lixiviate of uh, fluids, so we are recovering and there is another parameter that we are following that is the cooking loss. And again, we are profiling fat, cholesterol, and COPs and this is again just an example of a chromatogram when you can see that the raw sample is pink and has high content of fat when it's cooked, this profile change, obviously because it starts to be oxidized. Uh, when you say over the top, you get 80% like the lean, right? The, the percentage of lean means like 80%, 20% is fat? Yes. Okay. Yes, because, um, for example, for, for hamburger, we have up to 95%, 90%, and 80% lean. So we have different categories of that meat. So in general, this is the information of the database. Again, we have more than 100 items, and we want to continue to update this. This project was partially funded by the Center of Research of Ingredient Safety, Chris, here in MSU, and the idea is to publish this information as an open access database that everybody can see. If you put the brand, the name, the portion, you will see that you will have the opportunity to get per grams of fat, per grams of sample, or per size portion. And obviously, we think that with this database, with this information, we will help in general the food supply chain because farmers that are growing um, the cows for the meat, the poultry, the millet, etc., will have this knowledge. Also, the process in itself, food scientists, food engineers can enhance, optimize the processes in order to reduce the formation of these compounds. People that is working in packaging can enhance the films, the type of packaging, in order to avoid the formation of these compounds. And in general, when we have uh, the point of sales that we are displaying the products, avoid, obviously, like exposure, change of temperatures, etc. So we are thinking that this information will be useful for this um, food supply chains, but also for the medical area because we will have more nutritional information. We can plan clinical interventions with a solid number of our diet. We can participate or help in the drug delivery development because if we want to avoid this compound formation in the body, we know what is the amount that we're expecting to have with the diet. We can enhance the precision medicine and in, in general the healthcare system. So we think that we have uh, the opportunity to, to help this um, two big areas. So now I will jump to the aim three um, because again the overall goal is to know what is the real risk that we have long term exposure of these compounds. We are eating every day, three times a day if we can. So what is the risk that we have? It? So in order to do that we have the aim one done. We have, we are working right now in the aim three, but the aim two is still pending. So what we'll do, so for uh, now, working in the aim three, we can use results from previously Therathur. In the meantime, we develop the aim two. What is the reason to wait for the aim two? What is the information that we know? We know a little about the absorption of the COPs. We know that there are absorbent in the small intestine, um, that all COPs have different rates of absorption in comparison with cholesterol. 
Some example is that one species, for example, the seven beta hydrocholesterol, has the highest rate of absorption. There are other ones that have lower rate in comparison, but the toxicological activity is high. So, um, in general, since the absorption rate is different, and we know there are more than 100 compounds, it's hard for us to predict this this rate in a, in a in, um, in a dietary risk assessment. That is the reason because we are proposing to do the admetox with a specific diet in order to get this information. So, so is the absorption affected by circumstances like microbiome or fiber, you know, along with, <coughs> so let's say you, you have fiber content along with the COPs that you're ingesting, does that alter absorption? The, the only information that we have in hand is that they are sourcing in the small intestine. So they are not cross, they are not have, they don't have contact yet with the microbial gut. So that is the only information that we have now. So that's why it's for us important to perform this admetox study to realize if there is an interaction with the good microbiome or not. We need to take them into account or not because it looks like it's just in the first stage of the digestion when they are crossing the barrier. So it's something that we still don't know. But we need to consider that the good microbiome play, play an important role. But until now, there is no evidence that they can be in contact with the good microbiome. And, and do you think that like fiber or things that make it pass through more quickly perhaps or something has any barrier or, you know, any I don't think so, because it depends on the structure, the molecule. Some of these are more pollen even than cholesterol. So I think that is more related with the chemical of the component itself that in um, coexisting with other molecules, you know. So that is my first hypothesis. But it's something that we might need to also investigate. Okay, okay so. That is the reason because the AIM-2 is still not done. So working in the um, AIM-3, I don't know if you are familiar with SHETS. Um, this is a program that has been developed by EPA. Um, obviously, it pre um, predicts uh, exposure that can be by uh, diet, by inhalation, by contact with the skin. So for us, it's a good model to start. Uh, we will use enhanced data. Uh, the most important information that we want to get is the population exposure through the diet of these compounds. So again, we will follow uh, step by step the SHED's proposal um, model, but we will focus only in the dietary ingestion. So. There is no evidence of other no dietary ingestion of cholesterol and COPs. There is no evidence of inhalation of cholesterol. So their manilination and no, no dietary ingestion will be discarded and we will focus this only in the dietary ingestion. This model has been successfully used in um, several products, chemical, and again, we have been in contact with the uh, major developer of this a software in order to get the information that we want to use to generate our population um, in USA and obviously the dietary exposure. And this database again, hopefully it will grow over the years with the generation of new food products, um, for example, another consideration organic versus non-organic, etc. We will continue taking this database and we are focusing in the cardiometabolic diseases. What is the reason? Because cholesterol has been linked to several cardiovascular diseases, and we know that is a major concern in the public health in the U.S. So, again, these are some of the uh, factors that we are considering when we are applying uh, the dietary exposure assessment for um, cardiometabolic diseases. The current research that we have in our laboratory, again, this database. Also, we have another project when we are evaluating the oxidative status of cholesterol content versus COPs content in infant formulations. 
The reason is because we have more than 50 different types of infant formulations in, in U.S., and we know that this has been built with more than 50% of fat. Cholesterol is not declared in the nutritional level, and all preliminary results has been shown both cholesterol, phytosterols, and COPs in infant formulation. So how can impact this consumption in the baby during the first year of the development is something that we are interested to, to know. Other interesting projects is the role of cholesterol in the dysfunction of brain aging, during the aging. So again, in our body, the brain is the major um, organ that contains cholesterol. And we have interest in to know if it's cholesterol itself or the production of COPs, which are playing a critical role in this cholesterol homeostasis dysfunction. So the brain cholesterol is peculiarly in situ synthesized? Yes, and yes. Uh, it's not, it's not related with the diet, correct? Yeah, so probably minimally affected by the diet. Yes, definitely. But in this case, we are looking <coughs> for the mechanism of endogenous versus ROS generation, no dietary. Yes, is the diet until now don't play a role here. So these are my collaborators. So the suspicion is probably because in the brain, the, you know, the uh, metabolic is energy consumption is so high, so there are going to be a lot of byproducts or what? Yes, in the brain we have two major mechanisms. The first one is the generation of this species by the P450 family and that is the major mechanism. The second mechanism that we, are, uh, we have the hypothesis is that during an inflammation pro process, the regeneration of ROS, and these ROS can start to attacking the cholesterol and forming these compounds. So that is the major hypothesis behind this study. And obviously we think that the cholesterol dysfunctions precede the amyloid uh, formation. And these are my collaborators from um, University of Michigan, Grand Rapids, etc. And the last project, again, we want to link the Western diet with the chronic diseases, thinking in myocardial dysfunctions, atherosclerosis, placental dysfunctions, etc. So again, we want to know if real cholesterol the bad guy or are these COPs who are, you know, uh, exerting the major um, role in these uh, diseases. And just here, a, a small example of the infant formulation. Um, obviously, we have the capability, as I showed you, to discriminate between um, endogenous and dietary. And this project, I like it so much because we know that the first year of an infant, mostly is milk, either breast milk or infant formula, the only meal that they have. So it's a perfect model to work with. And again, I just want to thank my team. Um, because without them, I cannot do anything. Uh, Dr. Gustavo de los Campos, that is part of this risk assessment project. And again, this project has, was partially f funded by Chris. And if you have any question, please let me know. Thank you. So I'm just curious, when you talk about the database about uh, pesticide from food, how good are they? I mean, this database is already published in the EPA website. So again, they, that uh, project was only an inspiration to build this database because usually uh, food safety is only in two points, in microbial reduction in the pesticide, herbicide, and radionuclease point of view. Again, that is the government and many societies has been focused mainly. But again, we are not adding anything to the meals here. Is the meal itself when we are cooking it or processing that has been producing these compounds. So that, that was just a, an idea and inspiration when we took to do this, this project. Yo, several of the classifications of food and then mentioned the Western diet. I wonder if the Western diet includes snacking or includes uh, fast food or uh, what, what do you specify? Yes, the Western diet, uh, most than 40% of the Western diet is fast food and ultra-processed food. So that is the reason because we focus it mainly on those um, type of foods. But also uh, we know that until now, 
at least 40% is only eating fast food and ultra processed food. I mean, at least the majority is still cooking at home. So that's why we want to uh, understand what is the cooking method that contributes mostly to the generation of these compounds as well. So the database will include two things, just the database by product, but also the cooking method. Um, first of all, is there, is there like NHANES data of blood, le blood levels of uh, oxidized cholesterol? Has that been published? Or? No, in fact, um, and has has only total cholesterol data, and the most updated data that we have is from 2018. And in base of that, I will show you quickly that this is out the aim to propose it um, model when we have. Uh, five diets. This is the regular control diet. This is the hot fat diet, and we disagree completely in previous studies because has high fat diet doesn't contain cholesterol. This is a bias. The total Western diet that has been already modifying that contain fat, carbohydrates, and cholesterol, and the ultra processed um, diet. When we have this data that we got from our database in terms of COPs content. And again, we want to know the biological signatures. And as you mentioned it, we want to know also if there is something about the gut microbiome because we don't know. But we are thinking that uh, we will follow it because it will be interesting to either discriminate or confirm that there is an interaction. stressors are the yin, the yang is antioxidants. So if you know if you're looking for the health outcome, you may have to look at both sides of the equation. Yes. Because if someone's compensating with antioxidants, maybe yes. <coughs> yes, it's true. I mean we have, uh, in the terms of the full engineering lab, we have another project that I didn't put it here because we are working with place-based metabolites that are dull, flavonoids, and thiosanins, and we have, again, another uh, set of uh, methods to identify and quantify them, but definitely we have been starting to um, mimic the LDL and put it different uh, amounts and types of these antioxidants and evaluate if there is a real interaction, there is a reduction, there is what is the mechanism by which these compounds can exert this antioxidant activity. So yes, we are considering that part, but we are starting with model systems because in a human body, in a marine body, it's pretty complex. We found that there is antagonism sometimes and synergies and sometimes mixing these species. So we want to first use a model uh, when we understand the mechanism and then expand from that. So I have a question. You took the EPA model and say, well, uh, I'm going to generate a database where it, I, I will know from each product how much I expect uh, the COP concentration to be. Okay, so I know that. Then I will take date, uh, dietary data uh, and then I will plug all this in this exposure uh, model that the EPA developed to estimate the exposure of uh, COPs for people that are following this diet. Yes. But uh, I think it would be very interesting to try to do a biological validation of it. Somehow, going back to the point that was mentioned before here, uh, you know, do some follow-up on some people and do dietary questionnaires, predict with the model how much will be the exposure, and then measure in blood samples how much you found. Yes, because definitely. Because maybe, you know, 99% is internally produced and, you know, I think that, that, you know, that thing will be essential to, and I don't know if the EPA has done that form of validation for the I don't chemical know exposure, but uh, I think, you know. It will be interesting will be to do it, yes. Have, well, you know, this model that we're predicting from a Monte Carlo simulation mm -hmm. is actually correlated to what we see in blood. Yes, in fact, that is a, a, a a great idea, and I think this will be a long term because definitely with an intervention, we will validate our biological signatures that we are expecting to identify here. Otherwise, yes, it's, 
the model is not complex. You can estimate exposure, but uh, what's the consequence of exposure on the, on the organism? Uh, and, and yes, definitely, uh, we are thinking in uh, specific populations, as I told you. The first one is the infants, the second one is the teenagers, um, the, the final one is people in university or workers, you know, in the uh, most productive age, to have this real information. Actually, we, I don't have some data similar to what we started thinking because we have in the, in the study that we will be working, we will do the metabolomics. And we have the dietary questionnaires also. These are clone adults. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can call from the metabolomics with the CRP graph. It's metabolomics. a target metabolomics. Maybe we will go all the way to. Yes, and for example, we, the, the questionnaire is another. Uh, I cannot say issue, but it's another thing that we need to consider. If you look at the enhanced questionnaires, general, if I can say, because when you ask, have you eaten, I don't know, how frequently do you eat soup at home? You don't know if that soup was really prepared or was purchased or is a canned soup. So that's why we also are uh, develop a more a specific questionnaire because we want to know the product. Again, you eat at home, yes, but it's a pizza that you purchase in a Franchise or is a ready to eat pizza that you need to just warm it, you know? So, again, there is a bias still there, and we want to know more about the process. So, yes, definitely, I think I will need your help. <laughs> I, you kind of just mentioned it now, but I was curious is the end is it a questionnaire then? Like self report? So, there's no, like, no, no, it's just how frequently do you eat that item? In base of your answer of that given item, but again, it's not included the processing. Yeah. It's, you don't know, I mean. Like, it just seems really. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, we are updating and creating our own questionnaire because, yes, definitely, we don't know. I mean, you can say, yes, I eat every day at home. I don't eat anything outside. But if you purchase something that is ready to eat and you eat it at home, again, the process is there. So. Um, many things that we need, that's why I think it's a, a holistic approach. I mean, your opinion, biostatisticians, uh, medical area, because we all together, we need to think what else is missing. It's not just a questionnaire and that's it, you know. What else is missing that we might need to consider in this issue? All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank Let's you. Continue.